Good morning, everyone. Tribal Summit this morning. Our first session this morning is the Super Fun session, and our first speaker this morning is Mike Atier with EPA. Um, Mike, welcome, and I will turn the floor over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be the, I think, guess the first speaker. And um, as Karen said, my name is Mike McAteer. I'm an on scene coordinator at the EPA in Dallas. And um, I'm going to run through the Goodrich asbestos site cleanup we did in Miami, Oklahoma, um, oh, a little over a year ago. Uh, and uh, just take you on a visual tour of what we did up there. Um, in case you're not familiar with Miami, it is located in the very northeast corner of Oklahoma in Ottawa County, um, about an hour, 20 minutes drive northeast of Tulsa. It's the last county you go through as you're going east towards Missouri or northeast into Kansas. Um, this is an aerial photo of the city of Miami, um, or a part of it. And our site is that area, I don't think my don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it's this red area outlined on the northeast side of the city of Miami. So it's not on the outskirts of town, it's on the edge of town. We are in the area of residences um, as well as schools, and I'll show you that in just a second. So the Goodrich is best, or excuse me, the Goodrich plant was a, a tire manufacturer. Um, that operated at this location. Um, this is actually a photo taken from an airplane when the plant was still open and operating. It was a very large plant um, in the neighborhood of 1.6 million square feet. Um, at its peak, it was uh, higher. Or there were employees in the numbers of about 2,000, and uh, it was running 24 hours a day producing tires. Um, the plant operated from around 1945 and then unfortunately was shut down in 1986. Um, it was uh, a, a big disappointment to the local economy again with 2000 employees um, losing their jobs. Most of the operations were moved to its sister plant in Alabama at the time. So again, the plant closed in 86. It went through uh, the ownership of the property changed hands multiple times. Um, between 1986 and 2014, um, and by the way, Goodrich uh, was uh, purchased by uh, the Michelin Corporation, uh, I believe, in 1990. Um, but it, the property itself in Miami was, uh, changed hands, like I said, multiple times, and in 2014, it ended up with a redevelopment company that uh, was working with the city to hopefully put the property back to some kind of a use, right? It just been left uh, this big empty shell of a building there. Um, and so they were working with the city and then the state uh, was involved. The uh, Oklahoma DEQ um, was aware that the building, like most buildings of this era, 1940s, 1950s, a lot of the structure um, contained asbestos. Uh, everything from the roofing material to the flooring material uh, to fire doors and so forth. So because of they knew it was had asbestos in it and a demolition process um, would possibly disturb that asbestos, um, the state wrote up an agreement with uh, the demolition company that owned the property um, to how to handle the asbestos under all the federal and state regulations. Um, this is what the property looked like after the demolition process, and again, I'm not sure if you can see this very well. So if you think back to the aerial photo I showed you a minute ago, that large plant, all that's left of it is these buildings on the left um, and one building to the south, and then a couple of scattered buildings on the west, or excuse me, east side of the property that I'll talk about in a minute. The rest is all concrete pad where the building once stood. And most importantly, what I'm hoping you're getting from this picture is you can see these piles um, that are neatly stacked around the property. Um, that's what's left of the building that didn't get removed. So unfortunately, that the, the redevelopment slash demolition company that brought, bought the property um, took most of the building down. I'd say 70 to 80 percent of it came down. Um, and unfortunately, uh, per the agreement that they were supposed to remove all the material because it was known to have asbestos in it, they uh, went bankrupt. Uh, returned to their home in Alabama and left the problem sitting there. 
Uh, this is what it looked like when uh, DEQ asked EPA to come up and take a look at what was going on there. Um, there were piles, actually specifically 20 piles uh, across this concrete pad, which used to be the floor to the building. Um, as I mentioned, a few structures were left standing or half demolished. I'll talk about that in a minute. But these piles were left scattered across the, uh, the pad. Um, the material was pretty chewed up by the time we got there. They had run over it, crushed it down, um, all for the purposes of loading it and taking it away, which they didn't do, unfortunately. Um, here's another close up. If you look at the picture on the right, um, this is a close up of one of the piles. So this is what we would believe um, was the main problem. So this is what we believe to be a roofing structure um, that when it was on the roof intact, uh, it was in a non friable condition. Once they tore it down, broke it apart, ran over it a few times, pushed it into these piles, they took what was friable asbestos and made it into a friable condition, meaning it was releasable. These fibers would be releasable. Um, and uh, so that was the biggest concern. These 20 piles, well, actually 19, one of them was a pile of metal, 19 of them were containing asbestos. So DEQ asked us to take a look at the piles. They had already done a little bit of sampling and found asbestos, um, but the full extent wasn't known. So in uh, November of 2018, uh, we did an assessment of all the piles. Uh, again, hopefully this shows up well in this area where the pad is located, where the building used to be standing, and each of the piles is numbered. And we went through those with licensed asbestos contract employees and pulled out samples from each of them, uh, multiple samples from each pile. And we found that um, the, the asbestos levels ranged all the way up to 40%. Again, the entire pile was not contaminated. Remember, most of it was brick and mortar, um, but unfortunately it was commingled now with this asbestos material throughout each of the piles um, on the order of nearly 16,000 cubic yards. Um, the, couple of structures that were standing, one of them was in what was called an oven building, uh, again, uh, used by the tire manufacturer. This was halfway dem demolished and also several storms after the building was uh, uh, left standing tore part of the building down. But it gives you a good example of the kind of material we were dealing with. So if you see this building on the top left, this right at the top um, along there, this bluish gray, uh, sheeting is actually called transite um, and if you know anything about transite it typically contains 30 to 40 percent asbestos in it it was used a lot back in the 40s and 50s i think even into the 60s um, and unfortunately of this you can see it's in bad condition it's been torn down lying partly on the ground scattered all throughout the area and again it's become from gone from non-friable to a friable condition also, this material inside the building, you can kind of see these weird looking structures sitting there. Those were heating exchange units. Those were also full of asbestos. But because this building was obviously in an unstable structural condition, we couldn't go in and just remove the asbestos, right? It was too dangerous to put anybody in there. And I'll show you how we handled that. Uh, there was a second small building out front that used to be the entrance to the uh, Goodrich plant. This was also 1940s era building full of asbestos from top to bottom and also unfortunately in unstable condition and containing uh, asbestos levels up to 70%. And the third big building we had on site uh, was known as the powerhouse building. Um, this was at one time where the this massive plant got its, its power through uh, mostly through steam generation with boilers in the building. Um, and then sending the, the steam uh, throughout the uh, plant itself. This place was loaded with asbestos, um, mostly piping and, and uh, wrap around the piping and the boilers themselves from top to bottom. Uh, again, 15,000 square feet, almost 50 feet tall. The building was in good structural condition. Um, it was not considered unstable. So we handled it a little bit differently and I'll show you that in a second. But the, the, the asbestos contained in this building was up to 80%. So they didn't miss a location where they couldn't put asbestos. Um, this is just some pictures from inside that powerhouse building. Again, just a labyrinth of, of piping full of asbestos wrap that was in a deteriorating condition. That's us taking a sample uh, of one of the boilers on the right. 
And then finally, there were there were two basement areas. The, 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 the concrete pad mostly sits right on the ground, except for one area in the northwest corner of the uh, structure known as the autoclave basement. And that's a picture of it here. Um, it was still open to the environment. Um, it was not a closed basement in the traditional sense. Um, and you can see from these pictures uh, that the asbestos wrap around these piping was uh, in pretty poor condition, deteriorating. Again, going from non friable to friable condition. And then we also had these utility pits scattered across the site, particularly on the western edge. Um, they, they were full of water. We, at first, we thought it was possibly rainwater that just wasn't evaporating. And then we also thought, well, possibly groundwater was recharging uh, these pits, but they were all filled with water. Um, they were also filled, unfortunately, you can see on the right where we pump one down, uh, full of debris that was left there by the construction company with asbestos. Plus, a lot of them still had piping, the original piping with asbestos material in a very deteriorated condition. We, we later learned, by the way, on the water that it was more likely that it was broken pipes under the concrete pad that was eating away at the soil, of course, around it, and then causing a cave in at the concrete above it, um, that this water then was being dispersed uh, across the uh, entire area of the, the concrete pad, and it kept recharging these, these pits. By the way, these pits, in case you're wondering, um, were, were set up so that heavy equipment would be set inside of them. We went to the local uh, museum and got some good photos um, inside the building before it was demolished. And so this, these were production lines basically for the tire manufacturing. People worked on either side of these, uh, these pits where these heavy equipment was located. All the equipment, of course, had been removed. Uh, we also had this miscellaneous ways. Unfortunately, the owner, uh, the last owner who went in, been into bankruptcy and, and returned to Alabama, um, left us with some other gifts. Uh, at the top, there's approximately 2,500 fluorescent bulbs he had removed from the old structure. Um, as most of you know, these fluorescent bulbs contain a small amount of elemental mercury, so we didn't want to leave those there uh, abandoned. And then at the bottom, we had collected up in one of the still standing st uh, structures that uh, on the southern part of the site, there was a myriad of, of household hazardous waste, as we would call it, paints, paint thinners, bleaches, um, that kind of material. We collected that up also. And then finally, uh, on the uh, far eastern side of the property, there's, uh, if you go by there, you'll see this structure still there on the left. That's uh, this large black tank. There used to be three of them. Um, they contain uh, urban black, if some of you may be familiar with it. It's a mined material. Um, it's actually, I didn't know this until I started working on this project, but um, when they produce rubber for tires, it's actually white. Um, in order to get our tires black, they add carbon black. And so they still had this tank about a third full of it and um, easily accessible. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Carbon black, by the way, um, is considered a uh, inhalation hazard by OSHA. So we didn't want to leave it out there um, for fear that this structure eventually would come down or somebody could get into it. And on the right are, are two pictures of what were called Banbury mixers. Um, we had to look that up too. That was these are massive uh, pieces of equipment that apparently couldn't be removed by the uh, previous owner um, to scrap for metal. Uh, they're used in the blending of the polymers to make the tires, uh, and they were loaded with, um, you can see, hopefully, especially that bottom picture, you can see the uh, oil and grease that were still coming off of these things and running off uh, onto the nearby soil in the area. Um, we sampled it, too, by the way, and for some reason, that oil and grease came up high in, in heavy metals also. So obviously we had a big problem, our biggest problem, despite uh, everything I showed you there was still the asbestos. Um, I'm sure everybody is aware of the health effects from asbestos. Um, I, uh, it's considered a carcinogen. It's uh, the biggest health effect is the possibility of, of causing mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the uh, um, membrane uh, covering in your lungs or your chest cavity. 
there is also a direct direct link to uh, lung cancer, as well as well as uh, laryngeal cancer. Plus, asbestos also has a non-cancer effect, just as lethal, known as asbestosis, which is a scarring of the lungs, which eventually makes it impossible to breathe. So our highest priority was, of course, those piles. Um, the state was also concerned, and for because this property, even though it was fenced, um, it was an incredible attractive nuisance because of where it's located, I guess. Um, people were continuously breaking into the structures and, being, and getting on the property um, with the fear that we had that obviously they could take things off the property. We assumed people were breaking in to uh, steal the metal and salvage it and get some money for it. We were afraid they would also be taking the asbestos debris with them. Um, so the, our two biggest priorities were to remove the asbestos piles and, and close up the access problem. Um, again, here's a picture of the, the site area. The piles are all scattered across here. The areas to the south and east, uh, so on the bottom and to the right of the picture, is where there's uh, all residential. And then, unfortunately, on top of it, the areas circled or um, marked off in yellow are not one, but unfortunately, three schools right on our eastern perimeter. There was a Head Start school, which is pre K a middle school and an elementary school. So we were concerned obviously about anything, any asbestos moving in that direction, not just residential, but towards these schools. So the debris piles, I mentioned the access, people continuously cut holes, even after we were out there patching up the holes, closing off this at the bottom is a picture of the, uh, one of the entrance ways to the, uh, to the um, powerhouse building. Um, as soon as we boarded up and put everything as heavy we could put in front of it, they would come in behind us and tear open these 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 areas. Um, like I said, this had to be done at least four or five times before we got out there for the cleanup, uh, just to keep people out of these, these structures. And in that basement area I showed you, it was a huge, but we would put heavy metal material across those entrance ways and they would be able to pry their way in there. Um, again, with the assumption they were stealing the metal, we're not quite sure. So the cleanup process, well, actually the first phase, which was the piles, um, was done as an emergency removal. We started in June. The goal was to get it done while school was out for the summer. Um, pretty simple process, <clears throat> excuse me, um, by uh, just bringing in trucks. They had to be lined with six mil poly. Uh, so you see them doing that here. And then it's just a case of moving the material from these piles. Basically, we were finishing the job that this demolition slash uh, reuse company had started. So removing the piles, loading them into these, these uh, line trucks, you can see the biggest job was keeping everything wet, right? So the goal was not to have any air emissions containing asbestos moving off the site towards the residential areas or the schools um, during this process. Uh, so there's a guy on the hose on one side, can't see it, but there's another one on the other side. Uh, then the, once the trucks re reach their uh, weight limit, uh, it's just as simple as pulling that extra poly up, wrapping this uh, material up in kind of a burrito fashion where you overroll it and, and close it off. You staple it or tape it or glue it down. The truck is then tarped and off they go to the landfill. Um, uh, all the workers, by the way, you can see in this picture had to be in what's called PPE level C, meaning they had to wear the Tyvek suits, go through uh, decon processes going in and out of the site. And you can sort of see here, this gentleman has a uh, respirator on um, with cartridges for specifically made for his best. So made the job extra hard and extra hot during the summer uh, doing this process. The the landfills I mentioned, so there we, we went, we're using two landfills. They had to be asbestos approved and EPA and state approved. Um, the primary one was the closest one was located about a half an hour north of Joplin, Missouri. Um, and then our secondary one that we use primarily on weekends because they were open on Saturday was uh, just outside Tulsa. So the two unstable structures had to be taken down in what's called a wet demolition process. Um, pretty straightforward there too. It's just a case where we take a large excavator in and knock the building down. But 
you have to, because we can't remove the asbestos uh, because the building is unstable in advance of tearing the building down, it's all about keeping it super soaked on this area. So you can see there's not just hoses being used, but on the bottom picture, you can see on the far right, there's a water cannon. We brought in two of them. So you're keeping the area constantly misted and wetted down. Um, there's a close up of one of the water cannons on the, on the bottom there. And uh, you can see it at the top there. They run off generators. There are actually two of them on. Uh, that's the uh, the uh, power, or, excuse me, the oven building being torn down at the top there uh, that came down in about a week. So again, keeping it wet so that nothing's moving off site. So you might be asking yourself at this point, so how do you know nothing was moving off site? Well, we were running air monitoring stations on the perimeter. If you can see in this photo, there are five of them, two along the southern edge between us and the residents to the south, two along the eastern edge between us and the schools and the residents. And then we added an additional one on the north. There is um, kind of a park area just to the north of us. Uh, with multiple uh, soccer fields. So we wanted to make sure that nothing was moving in that direction. Uh, the good news is through the eighth month, eight months of work out there, these monitors, which I'll show you in a second, uh, did not pick up asbestos other than one time. And that was kind of a strange uh, situation. It did not exceed our air clearance value, but we did pick up one location on the Eastern perimeter just once in those eight months. So we were obviously doing a decent job of keeping it wet because we didn't have any offsite movement. So on any asbestos job where we're working outdoors like this, we run two pieces of equipment. This is just a close up of one of the ones along our eastern perimeter. Um, this large black box on the table that we had set up um, is a dust monitor. So anytime, and it was set up connected to a telemetry system. Um, so at any time, I or our contractors could look at my phone or their phone. Um, and see what our actual readings were. Uh, so we were getting uh, real-time readings from this showing whether or not the dust levels were high enough um, that were triggering us that we were not keeping it wet enough. It didn't tell us whether it had as best as it just said whether or not the dust was too high and we needed to either add water or if it was too windy, we would just shut down operations for the day. A small box to the right of it, the blue one, and this is a little harder to see the picture to the right hopefully shows it a little bit better it, it's connected to a, um, a a collection tube um, and there's a pump at the bottom of this table that runs non-stop all day while we're operating and it's pulling air through this this little canister here there's a filter inside there and as it pulled air through the air there at the end of the day we pull it out pull this little canister out um, pull the filter out, look at it under a microscope and see if there's any fibers. If there are any fibers, which it's not unusual to see fibers, but fibers can come from any, any kind of um, piece of material. Um, the question was, was there asbestos in it? Then we would have a laboratory who's licensed to do this, take a look and tell us not whether or not we had um, any asbestos. And like I mentioned, fortunately only once, and it happened to be a day where the, the city was um, mowing on the outside, on the, the, the right of way on the outside of the fence line, um, going past here, mowing the, the, the grass, and it kicked up dust, obviously. And we found asbestos, again, not exceeding the cleanup standard. Um, we went out and took samples throughout this whole area around the perimeter just to make sure we hadn't missed anything. We didn't find any asbestos, so it's still a bit of a mystery as to why we got that hit that one day. So the work was finished up on this first phase um, in September, just as school was starting. So we met our goal. This is kind of the after pictures. You can see this big concrete pad, which once was the BF Goodrich plant has been cleared of all the debris piles. Um, there's a before and after top and bottom. Um, after that, we uh, knew we wanted to handle the powerhouse building, which again was an incredible tractive nuisance. Um, to the locals, uh, we were still having problems even with us being on site and with security with people sneaking in and trying to get into this building. Um, we wanted to abate all the uh, asbestos inside that building, um, address those pits and basements, as well as the miscellaneous waste, the Banbury mixers, the carbon black, um, the bulbs and the hazardous waste. 
The, the powerhouse building was a big operation given its size and the amount of material in there. Um, we hired a separate subcontractor that does just asbestos abatement to handle this since they are experts at this and have teams that are very good at, at doing this. So they literally were in their crew of about 12 or 13 people, six, sometimes seven days a week for about three months, removing all this asbestos material. It's just some photos from inside while they're working. The process in a, in a stable building for removing this is all under, falls under the NESHAPS regulations, federal and state. Um, two ways of doing this, either they can cut the asbestos piping off, obviously you've got to keep it wet, um, and then put it into what are called glove bags, or if it's easier, cut the pipe off, just wrap that up and move that off. So it's done in both ways inside the powerhouse building. Um, you also have to have third party um, uh, oversight of all of this. Um, so we had a licensed asbestos uh, company come up and routinely do inspections of the asbestos removal inside the building. Um, at the end of the process, when the uh, third party um, asbestos company gives the thumbs up, uh, the property is then sprayed down with this encapsulant. It's called lockdown procedure. You, this is, these are pictures showing that you can kind of see this whitish material covering everything. That's simply to catch any fibers that may have gotten loose during the, the abatement process, which is going to happen, um, basically lock them down. After that, then air clearance has to take place. We got lucky that on our first try, um, we were able to pass air clearance inside the building and had to meet the OSHA standard of, I believe it's 0 0.01 structures per, per uh, cubic centimeter. So they did a pretty thorough job cleaning that building out from top to bottom. We also simultaneously were addressing these utility pits and this, this map gives you a little better picture. Those pink areas are the old piles that were there. The uh, pits and basements were primarily located uh, along the eastern, excuse me, western edge and another one to the to the east. Um, again, just some photos beforehand. You can see some of the piping with the asbestos material in it. Um, again, they were full of water, uh, so they had to be pumped down continuously to keep up ahead of them. Um, just some more pictures of the before, these large tanks that have been dropped into these uh, pits and basements. These are fully coated with asbestos that's in a deteriorating state, had to be removed which was a real trick getting into these pits with the equipment. These are some after pictures once we got them cleaned out that took a couple of months, pumped down. Um, the largest pit of all was on that western edge that I showed you there. This was a basement of some sort, uh, and then the abatement company, or, or the uh, not the abatement company, but the demolition company that was running things literally filled this entire area where you see these gentlemen working at the bottom there from top to bottom with debris full of asbestos. So it all had to come back out and be removed. So that's just some soap shots of the cleaned out pits and basements at that process. The, ba the basement area, this, this basement on the northwest corner, the autoclave basement um, was a challenge. Also, uh, a lot of material in there. Unfortunately, it also filled up with water to a certain degree. So it made it a challenge to get in there. So all of this material had to be cut away. Most of it we did through the process of cutting off the, the asbestos material instead of cutting the pipe. A lot of this pipe was very thick uh, and the, the length of time needed to remove the pipe versus just remove the asbestos. It was easier to remove the asbestos and then take it out in bags. You can see in the low, the picture on the right, some of it bagged up there. A lot of it ended up on the floor, so we had to clean all that out. But those two pictures at the bottom, our af uh, the after pictures showing the cleanup, those are cleaned pipes. We did the lockdown procedure inside the uh, basement also, even though this technically didn't fall under the NESHAPS regulations, uh, we wanted it locked down anyways, and it didn't also require air monitoring uh, to clear it at the end, but we did anyway, and it passed fortunately. We also removed all that miscellaneous waste, the bulbs and all the material that had been abandoned inside that south warehouse. We had that taken off site to a licensed uh, incinerator. Um, the Banbury, or excuse me, the carbon uh, uh, black was addressed. I'll show you in just a second. The Banbury mixers again were addressed. 
So the picture on the left, if you can see it very well, it's not the best picture, but that's inside the actual tank that I showed you. Um, that cone is where the material came to the bottom and they could remove the material and it was piped out across to the, the Banbury mixers. There was actually still, you can see the pile there, that is carbon black sitting there. We had a company come in speci specifically to remove this material. Um, it was a very dirty job. It had to be done using back trucks so we didn't stir up this material, but we cleaned the whole thing out and um, put holes inside the tank so that nobody could act actually use this property or this tank again. Uh, the Banbury mixtures was a bigger job than we thought it was going to be cleaning those, not just using power washers, but basically scrubbing them from top to bottom. Um, this, these things were meant to last, let me tell you. Uh, we thought we could possibly scrap some of this metal wherever we could. It was very difficult to get this thing apart. So those, these are monuments. If you drive by there today, you'll still see them out there. Fortunately, they're cleaned up now. Um, you might be asking yourself at this point too, so how do you know that that concrete pad was clean after all those piles were located on it? Um, so what we did, we not only cleaned the pad, we had the special equipment that literally operated twice by running across this thing and scrubbing it, soaking it down and then collecting the water and running it through a five micron filter. But what we did was we broke the grid, or excuse me, we broke the, the pad into grids, 100 by 100 uh, feet in size. And then we randomly selected these purple grids to do um, what's called activity-based sampling. And it's as simple as basically, again, these are 100, 100 foot grids. Um, I guess I'm about at the end here. If you just do, I get another minute, Karen. Is that okay? Or yeah, you got, you got okay. one more. All Thanks. right, just I'll be. I'm just about done. So they they would simply put the air monitoring. You can see one on the right here around monitors around these these grids, and then take an air blower and run it for an hour to two hours to see if anything was stirred up on the pad. Um, in this. We did not have any of the grids fail for, for asbestos. So that clearly indicated we got through um, without leaving any asbestos material on that pad. So it's it's reusable. Um, and we're working with the city, by the way, right now and the county to see if this property can be put back to reuse. So in total, we removed just over 25,000 tons of asbestos containing material. Uh, about just under 1,700 trucks uh, were shipped out full of asbestos material. 5,400, or excuse me, 54 tons of carbon black removed. It took us about eight months to complete both phases of work. At peak, we had about 28 personnel working on the site, and the cost was in the neighborhood of $4.6 million. And that's that's it in a nutshell. I'll stop there. Uh, I don't know, Karen, if we have time for questions right now, but if there are any, um, I'd be glad to take them. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. If you want to check your chat box, Mike, to see if you have any questions, I don't see any in my okay. chat box. Um, also, uh, folks that have called in, you'll have to email either your questions to me or Mike. Um, if you email me, I will forward them on to Mike. Mike, if you hover at the top of your screen, um, a little box will pop up that says stop sharing. Okay. And then that way you can see your chat box easier. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on, our next presenter is Michelle Brown with EPA. And Michelle, I am making you a presenter right now and you should be able to share your screen shortly. And I will give you the floor, Michelle. Great, good morning, everyone. Let me share here.
All right, does everyone see the presentation? Yes, uh, Michelle, if you want to go up to display settings, because right now we're seeing your PowerPoint and the uh, the notes. Okay, so. PowerPoint, I'm sorry, which one from display settings? Yeah, go to display settings and click on the down, the, the down arrow. Okay, is that under the? It's right at the top of your screen. It's next to show taskbar. And then it says display settings. Okay, sorry. Let me stop sharing for a moment because it like went away. Okay. <laughs> Let me try again. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Is that better? It's still in presenter mode. <laughs> okay. Let me get rid of this presenter mode. That is weird. See. Oh. Better? Yes. Perfect. Great. <laughs> All right. Okay, everyone. Let's see. Get to the beginning. My name is Michelle Brown, and I am a site assessment manager and the NPL coordinator. That's the national priority list coordinator for EPA Region 6. And I'm going to be talking about the site assessment basic process. So, by the end of this presentation, hopefully, you'll be able to explain how sites are identified under CERCLA. CERCLA is your comprehensive environmental um, liability compensation liability act. And that's kind of the rule that all of this site assessment work is done under. You'll be able to describe the purpose, scope of the different steps of the site assessment process, um, understand the relationship of site assessment and how it works with removal and the remedial programs under CERCLA, and explain the roles and the responsibilities of the different parties um, in the site assessment process. So right here is your site assessment process. And if you can see my um, pointer here, um, it starts with pre-circle screening, to screen your sites. You have your discovery and adding sites to your inventory. It goes down to your preliminary assessments, your site inspections and your expanded site inspections, HRS packages, and then the eventual listing on the national priority list. Now, during this process, at any time, you can move to the removal program. We find that um, it needs to be uh, an emergency response or a removal taking place. And that's when you're going to get your on scene coordinators that um, Mike is part of involved. Also, at any point during this, it can be um, put into another program or um, NIPRAFT, which means no further remedial action planned. Um, it can go to RECRA. It can be deferred to the um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission if you're working with radiation. Also, you can have states and tribal cleanup programs get involved and take care of it. Or you can do something called a super fun alternative approach, which when you work with the PRPs to take care of the, the issues. So here we're going to talk about the first step in that process, which is your pre circular screening. Now, the benefits of this are. It's a cost effective method of determining if a site needs to be entered into SEMS. SEMS is your um, Superfund enterprise management system, and that's the Superfund database where we place all the sites. Um, you want to prevent any unnecessary sites entering into the SEMS. Um, database because once it's in there it needs to go through the those site assessment steps that we went through 
And you want to focus on the site assessment resources on sites that should be in there. So you don't want to spend a lot of time focusing on sites that can be handled either through another program or that um, is not going to meet circular requirements for eventual listing. Now, this during their pre circular screening, you can have limited and focused sampling. Most of the time, this is just a simple uh, report and checklist that you go through to see if um, it needs further work. So, some of your questions you're going to answer is the site already under Sims under another name, or has it been archived there? Um, it could have been looked at. Um, decades ago and found to um, not have anything that needed to be further looked at under CERCLA. Um, but it can change um, if the situation under the site at one point was rural and now it's, you know, uh, residential areas are being built around it. It may be needed looked at again. Um, you want to see if the site um, has some contaminants that are subject under the limitations of CERCLA. Um, does the site have hazardous constituents um, that meet those circular requirements? Or is it naturally occurring discharge, for instance? Um, is the state or tribal program in the final cleanup phase of the site? Is the state already addressing the site under their voluntary cleanup programs? Um, or is the hazardous substance that's out there, is the release subject to statutory exclusion? For instance, is the release uh, petroleum related, which would be part of the petroleum exclusion and CERCLA would not be involved in that. Is the hazardous substance released at the site deferred by policy? Um, that is when I was talking about is the policy, is it naturally occurring? Is it something that's not um, uh, looked at by the CERCLA itself? It could be looked at, at a, in another program. Is the site data that's out there sufficient to determine if it needs a SEMS entry? Do you have enough information to even uh, put it into the SEMS database? Is there documentation that clearly demonstrates that there's no potential for a release that could have adverse effect on human health or the environment? Even if it's hazardous substance, if it's well contained and it's not going to be, uh, has a potential to release, then that's not something you want to put into SEMS to go further down into the um, CERCLA process. So we talked about site discovery. A site discovery, we can find out um, CERCLA and EPRA. EPRA is um, another act, and it requires that anytime there is a release of hazardous substance above a reportable quantity, that it be reported. Um, these reportable quantities are within your circa circla 103a um, and it is a requirement that it be reported to a federal agency now epra is your emergency planning community right to know act and that requires that if you have an extremely hazardous substance that it and there's a reportable release that you notify your state emergency response commission and your local emergency planning committees that are going to be affected by the release. Now, there are penalties, there are civil and uh, criminal penalties for failures to report. So a lot of times this is how we'll discover sites is through this reporting process. Other ways that we discover sites are inspections that take place by federal or state authorities, um, sometimes through inventory or survey projects, um, looking at um, sites that are categorized as being historically hazardous, such as wood treatment or uh, metal electroplating, things such as that. Um, sometimes we'll discover it through an investigation or reporting that's done by the media. Um, if they report on something that um, they that that the community has taken to the to media. There's also citizen petitions that can take place and. There is a process for citizens to petition directly the EPA to do a preliminary assessment. And in that case, the EPA is required to 
look at the site and respond within one year of that citizen's petition. We also get a lot of sites directly from state and tribal agencies um, that let us know that there is a problem within their area. So your preliminary assessment, your PA is that second step. So after you've done your screening and, you've, and you realize that it needs to be put into that SEMS database and needs to be addressed, um, the first step in the process is doing that preliminary assessment. Um, well, second phase, first you discover, then you put it in, you do a preliminary assessment. Now it's gonna provide your initial analysis of your ex existing information. Um, you're gonna look at everything you have at this point. Um, do all the research on all the, the data that the state has, any data that maybe um, the EPA contains. You're gonna to try to find as much information you can, and you're going to do a brief report with formal recommendations on it. Again, the PA phase um, can have sampling, usually does not. This is usually where you do most of your background uh, research on it. So your goals of your PA is again, you want to look at everything you have and you want to eliminate any sites where you don't need further remedial action. So if again, if it's been deferred to, you can defer it to another program, if somebody else is taking care of it, if it just not, does not meet the, the requirements, you want to eliminate that site instead of going down further through the assessment process. You want to identify sites that require that emergency response, any removal actions. So you, you may do some research and figure out that this is something that um, needs to be taken care of right away with a removal action. You're going to compile all the information to develop preliminary projected HRS scores. So based on all this information you're compiling, again, you want to see if there is a possibility that it's going to go further down the line and possibly score and be put onto the national priority list. And it helps you set your priorities for your um, site inspections. So you're going to see how bad this really is. Does it need sampling right away? Is it, you know, so you're going to set priorities for that next step in the process. Now, instead of doing a full phase preliminary assessment report, there is the option of doing abbreviated PA. And basically your purpose of your abbreviated PA is if you have enough information to either say, there's no further remedial action that needs to be planned on this, you can NIF wrap it, or you already know that there's lots of information and it really is, you need to do some further sampling and stuff out there. Then you, it allows you to do a checklist and a um, smaller report than the full preliminary assessment. Um, it has to beat your requirements of your preliminary assessment, but you don't have to go into uh, as much work because you, based on the information you collected, you already know which um, way you're going to go, either with further with the SI or NIF wrapping it. So once you've done your preliminary assessment and you figured out that it looks like it, there's a possibility that we can go further down the line and, and do an HRS package and uh, try to list the site, then your step after that is your site inspection, your SI. Um, you're gonna build upon all the information you collected and analyzed during your preliminary assessment. Um, this is usually the first um, phase where you're gonna collect samples. Now, that's not to say you can't collect samples in the other phases, but traditionally this is the first time you go out and you do field work and collect those samples to try to support the hypothesis you came up with in your preliminary assessment. So during your preliminary assessment, you kind of figure out, okay, this is the pathway that, that these, this contamination is releasing into, and this is the additional data we need to collect. So everything you collect during this is going to support your eventual um, hazard ranking system package and your listing. So usually at this stage, you're going to have a narrative report, which has to be um, legally defensible, which means that 
you need to make sure as you're going through this assessment process, the data you collect is well referenced because um, everything has to be um, defensible when it goes into that HRS package phase. So, and this is also a lot of times where you really get um, score sheets going and trying to figure out what your eventual score um, for your HRS package will be. So your SI goals during this, you wanna collect and obtain additional data to evaluate the release pursuant to the HRS. So by the time you get into the, the SI, you know, like I said, which pathway you're looking at. Um, pathways are how your release of your hazardous contamination is going to get to a, a target or affect human health or the environment. So that's either gonna be groundwater, surface water, soil, or air is how it's gonna release. So you're gonna collect data pursuant to that pathway that you've identified. You wanna screen out sites that are not gonna score high enough for placement on your national priority list. So um, you're gonna to wanna to go out there and take bias sampling to see if you actually have something. Screen out the sites you don't have anything and be able to move forward with the sites you do. Again, um, at any time during PASI or any other part in your site assessment, you can um, identify any site that requires an emergency response or any site that needs to go to the removal action. So as you get more information, you may realize that it needs to go to removal. So after your SI, you're gonna to go to your hazard ranking system. So your hazard ranking system, your HRS, is your principal mechanism that's gonna be used to place these sites on the NPL. It uses a structured approach to score your sites, and it culminates in the preparation of the middle of an HRS scoring package to EPA. So I was talking about pathways and the release of hazardous substances. So there are the four pathways to the HRS. There is your groundwater migration pathway. And this is gonna be drinking water. You have your surface water migration. And surface water, you can have drinking water, you can have um, food chain, fish consumption, or you can have environmental, sensitive environmental. Then you have your soil exposure and your subsurface intrusion pathway. Um, subsurface intrusion pathway is a newer one. So you have your residents that are affected by soil, the nearby ones, and whether or not there is subsurface intrusion or vapor intrusion getting into structures. And then you have your air pathway. So, like I said, by the time you get to the HRS, even before you do your SI, you should know which pathway you're gonna focus on. Um, there's gonna be one pathway that is gonna um, be um, affecting individuals more than another, and you wanna focus your resources on that pathway. So this package, this HRS package is all going towards the national priority list and trying to list the site. Now, it's required by CERCLA that it's primarily an information and management tool. It requires rulemaking. That means, again, like I said, it needs to be everything you put in there is going to be scrutinized, legally defensible. So you want to make sure that all the information you have been collecting towards this national priority listing, the HRS package, um, has references that can be defended. So your mechanisms to be to place a site on the national priority list is through either this hazard ranking system package that you developed. It can be through a state designation. Um, every state when the HRS came about um, was allowed one pick uh, most states have used that, but they are allowed one to say, hey, we want this to be part of the national priority list and it 
that point they don't we don't have to go through the whole hazard ranking system. And there's also some other criteria that established by EPA and um, ATSDR that can um, put a site onto the national priority list. So one option that we were talking about as you're going through site assessment project uh, process is the Superfund Alternative Agreement approach. Now, this approach is one option for remediation of the site without actually placing the site on the national priority list. Um, enforcement policy allows EPA regions to pursue settlements with your potentially responsible parties without listing the site on the NPL. Now, you have to agree, uh, the EPA and the state has to agree on the options and coordinate the response. Um, the response selection oversight is the same as if the site was on the NPL. So the remedial and response actions that occur on the site have to be the same as if it was placed on the national priority list, even though it has not been on there. So you have to achieve similar results to the sites that have been placed on the national priority list. Now, earlier I was talking about the Superfund Enterprise Management System. That's the database where we put all the official repositories sites, non-site specific Superfund data and support of CERCLA. It contains um, information on hazardous waste sites assessments and remediation from 1983 to present. So it's a comprehensive database and data, data management system that inventories, tracks, releases addressed or needing to be addressed by the Superfund program. SEMS used to be called CIRCLIS. So you may have heard it um, referred to it as a CIRCLIS database at one point. Now sites in this database can be archived. Um, this means that there's no further interest under the Superfund program currently but it can be reevaluated if new information becomes available, such as new target populations. That's like I was saying, a site could have um, been in a very rural setting that wasn't affecting a, a population at the time it was originally looked at, um, but now there is, say, residential construction occurring on and around the site, then that site could be reevaluated. Just because it's archived doesn't mean that it's not going to be looked at again. So to give you an idea of the workflow um, and how the sites are narrowed down as you go through the site assessment process, this is a graphic that kind of shows you um, how many sites are actually looked at and how much actually go into the list at the end. And these are numbers that were collected in um, 2016. So out of 52,859 sites that were accessed under Superfund initially, um, during that pre-screening process, 7137 were screened out. And as you're going through it, about 150 sites are added every year. Then you have about 45,722 sites that are in that active site inventory. So those are the sites that are actively in the SEMS database. Then and as you go through, 36,000 of those 990, 989 were found to have be no further remedial action. They were NIFRAP. They don't meet the requirements to have further assessment done on them. And another 5,063, even though they were NPL caliber sites, they referred to other cleanup programs. So they were either deferred to the to RECRA, state tribal agencies to take care of it, other EPA removal programs or cleanup programs. So after everything's been either deferred to other sites or found that doesn't need any action, the very end out of those 52,859 sites, there's only 1,782 that were actually placed on the national priority list. So you can see as you go down the process that things get screened out and, and referred to other programs, um, a very small percentage actually ends up on the national priority list at the end.
So what are the roles and responsibilities for performing site assessment? Well, EPA is the, is the only ones that can do the, the hazard ranking systems and, and reviewing those. But state and tribal governments through cooperative agreements can do a lot of those preliminary phases. So a lot of the, the preliminary assessment work and the site inspection work is done at the state and tribal level. In addition, federal facilities have their are are do this assessment process under their jurisdiction. So that is a separate thing. Although EPA will review and, and help in it, federal facilities, if a site is on, on their property, they're gonna take care of the assessment process. And again, they have a different time uh, table and when federal facilities are taking care of their stuff, they're gonna have uh, put their things on a federal agency hazardous waste compliance docket. Um, they're required to complete the PA and SI within a reasonable time frame, which um, for EPA reasonable time frame is about 18 months. Um, their commencement of the remedial investigation feasibility study, the RIFS, which in six months of listing on the NPL. And they enter um, federal facility agreement, interagency agreements for remedial actions on sites under the NPL. And there are certain requirements applicable to the transfer of federal property. So community involvement when we're going through the site assessment process is going to vary a lot depending on the site. Um, it depends on the nature and severity of the threat, the expected length of the response action. Um, for instance, if you're going to be performing field activities as part of your site inspection, especially if you're going to be wearing the people out there are going to be wearing any sort of PPE such as respirators or Tyvek or something that's going to cause interest from the community who sees this, um, you want to make sure that you have notify the community of what's what's happening and any planned site activities. So recommended activities during the PAS fought SI phase of the assessment is designating a community involvement coordinator, distributing fact sheets to the community, let them know what you're doing while you're out there. Um, if it's a big site that's gonna get a lot of attention, issue news releases and updates on what's happening out there. Now, one big thing is that you're going through this process, the, the public, is offered an opportunity to comment on the proposed listing of the national priority list. So after the HRS package is put together and you propose it to the national priority list, there is a set time for the community to look at it and make any comments on it they want. So they have access to the report and all the references that are used um, towards you making your decision that the site meets those requirements and meets the 28.5, which is the score you have to meet for it to be part of the national priority list. So site assessment reports, recommendations need to be available. Um, can also be part of the administrative record if it's used to support an agency decision. So again, when you're going through this process from the PA to the SI to the HRS, you wanna make sure that you have um, reliable references, and um, all your ducks are in a row, your T's and I's, your T's are crossed, your I's are dotted. So as we are going through this, as I was saying, there, there is relationships with other federal cleanup authorities and programs. Um, site assessment does not work in a, bu in a bubble. Um, at any time, again, you can have response actions. And if it, even if it's excluded under the site assessment process, this is the petroleum exclusion, um, it can still be addressed by the removal program. So like response actions to oil spills under the Clean Water Act or the Oil Pollution Act. 
um, enforcement and corrective actions can be addressed under RECRA. Um, enforcement provisions or can be addressed under the Safe Drinking Water Act in Tosca. And so the integration of CERCLA and other cleanup authorities are always occurring. Um, CERCLA and site assessment does not work alone. It works with all these other programs. And again, not only does it work with other programs, it works with state and, and tribal programs as well. Um, they play a significant role in the cleanup of sites. Um, the relationship of the EPA cleanup authorities under CERCLA and RECRA and state and, and tribal response programs, including your voluntary cleanup program of the state. We usually have a memorandum of agreement. Uh, and there's also RECRA memorandums of understanding that occur. So, in summary, sites are assessed upon discovery or notification of a release, and they're entered into the SEMS database. Um, their sites are address, assessed using a phased investigation uh, consisting of your preliminary assessment, and if necessary, your site inspection or expand, expanded site inspection. Your ESI is just additional sampling that occurs. So, if you do your initial sampling under SI, you can do additional sampling under your ESI. Uh, sites are scored based on all the information you've collected using the hazard ranking system to determine if they are candidates for placement on the NPL. Again, that magical number for placement on the NPL is 28.5. And a removal action can take place at any time during this process if the conditions warrant. So that is it. And I'm running late on time, so I don't know if anybody has questions, uh, put it into the chat and I will try to address it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, once you stop sharing your screen, you should be able to see the chat box easier. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box for Michelle at this point. So, um, if anyone has any questions after the fact, they can send them to me. With that, we will move on to our next presenter, which is Phil Turner. I am going to give you change your role to presenter, Phil, and then you should be able to share your screen. Bill, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, we can see it. Um, I don't seem to be hearing you just yet, Bill. We are not hearing you, Philip. Phil, it, it shows that your mic is on. Uh, maybe turn your volume up. Bill, do you have a headset or mic plugged in? Is 
It shows your microphone is on. You might check to make sure you don't have a mic or headset plugged in on accident. Well, um, can you see if maybe your um, video will work? I, I can see your video. I just don't understand why there's no sound. Um, you've checked your speakers. You've made sure that you are not using a mic or a headphone or anything, just using your speaker on your laptop. Yeah, I can see you just fine. I just can't hear you for some reason. Um, maybe we can try. Do you want to try to log off and log back on real quick? And maybe that'll fix the problem. Can, can you hear me, Mike? Give me a thumbs up if you can. I can hear you okay, Karen. Is that you, Bill? Nope. Okay. I can see you talking, but I... <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe try to log off and try back on to log back on. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we'll try that, Phil. We'll do that real quick.
Okay, folks, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties that we're having this morning. Um, Phil is going to try to log back on and maybe that will fix the problem for him. So we're going to give him just a minute to see if he can get back on the call with us. Thanks for being patient. Okay, Phil, I see that you've joined us again and I have made you a presenter. So let's try this one more time. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you do. <laughs> wow. I, you know, I had to find a whole different link because, again, the link didn't want me to log in or didn't want me to, to let me in. So I tried a different one. It was a whole different attendee number. Oh, just yeah. wow. Crazy. <laughs> I know. It's kind of tricky sometimes, but hopefully now you can share your screen and we'll be good to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're <laughs> super late, aren't we? That's oh okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Our next session doesn't start till 1030, so you got a few minutes. Okay. Uh, can and we, we can see, see screen? your screen? Yep, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks. Good morning, and thanks, everyone, for, for be, being here and being patient. Uh, my name is Phil Turner, and I am a risk assessor in the Superfund program here in Dallas in the Region 6 office. So we are going to rapidly uh, talk about per, fluoro, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, as they've been, been come to known. And we'll go over a, a few basics and some of the things that are going on as of late. Okay, so now the slides won't advance. Okay, there we go. All right, so... PFAS, it's a, it's a class of man-made chemicals, and they are all over the place. Uh, so they're ubiquitous, and I, and I mean all over the place. We've heard all the stories of PCBs, DDT, and, and dioxins, and those things being everywhere and in everyone. Well, these things are too. Um, as best, you know, there's over 5,000 5, different versions of these compounds. We don't know the exact number, and, and we're finding or, or figuring on new ones on a regular basis. They have a very wide variety of industrial and consumer uses, and they degrade uh, very little or very slowly in the environment, and that's one of the reasons that they, they get their nickname forever chemicals. Uh, but unusually, they're highly mobile in the environment. Usually things that are very persistent, like PCBs or DDT, are not very mobile, but the, these guys are, some of them. Um, there's concerns due to known or suspected toxicity in a lot of cases, especially for PFOS and PFOA, uh, the two most well-known and most well-studied. So that those being considered the most toxic could change. Uh, they are known to be bioaccumulative and biomagnifying, which means they, they get caught up in the food chain and move up through the food chain. They can persist in critters and us for, for four to eight years, uh, give or take. Uh, the shorter chain PFAS, the ones with fewer carbons, the smaller molecules are more, tend to be 
more highly mobile than the longer chains. So, and as you might would guess, you know, information on these things is, is evolving very rapidly. Uh, next to, maybe next to microplastics, you, you're, you're, we're seeing more new information on these guys, uh, almost more than a whole lot of, a whole lot of others. Okay, a little bit of history. In 1949, 3M began producing PFOS compounds. In 1956, they marketed, they made and marketed uh, Scotchgar, which I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with. In 1964, 3M and the Navy created this thing called AFFF, or aqueous film forming foam, used in firefighting applications and a few others. In 1999, EPA began investigating PFAS. Uh, through the year 2001, PFAS continued to be one of the main components of AAAF. Nowadays, it's pretty rare to find PFAS or PFOA in those foams, although there are still some stockpiles from way back in the past where it can still be found. But a lot of the modern versions don't have at least those two PFAS anymore. But again, there's 5,000 options. In 2006, EPA and eight companies began a PFAS stewardship program. Uh, in 2009, EPA published its provisional drinking water health advisories, uh, 400 parts per trillion for PFOA, 200 parts per trillion for PFOS, and this was following the contaminate, contaminant candidate list number three and the uh, uncontaminated, mon uh, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule three. Um, so in 2009, EPA Region 4 was the first region or the first office to actually develop and start using a screening level for soil for PFAS. So everything else, we're pretty much focused on just water at the moment. In 2015, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality developed protective concentration levels for about 16 PFAS compounds, and they still have those uh, published, usually updated. They try to update every year. In 2016, we fi EPA finalized its drinking water health advisories for P4 or PFOS for both at 70 parts per trillion. So the number, they, they came up with a number that would sue either compound or both and it was a lot lower than the 200 or the 400. In 2018, uh, EPA hosted a national leadership summit. So it brought together a lot of scientists, a lot of uh, other agencies and people to, to sort of decide how we wanna tackle this issue. What are some of the more important questions and more important things that we as a nation and the EPA need to be doing in regards to these chemicals? Uh, also in 2018, and, and a little bit of update in 2019, the uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry did draft tox profiles on some PFOS and, P, or PFOS and PFOA and a couple of others for an intermediate oral minimal risk level, and their numbers are quite a bit lower. Uh, for PFOS, they said seven parts per trillion, and for PFOA, 11 parts per trillion. But these could be any oral route, you know, eating, drinking, a whole lot of, a whole, uh, a whole host of things. And they also do MRLs for inhalation, but I don't think they had one for P4 or PFOS at the time. And 2019, EPA published uh, our PFAS action plan, which sort of outlined some of the goals of the agency and some of the things that it, uh, some of the things it was doing, has done, and would like to do or effort towards in uh, addressing these chemicals. So in the production of these things, they're produced in two, primarily, two primary methods, electrochemical fluorination and telomerization. And for our purposes, that doesn't really mean a whole lot, but it, it just, it tells us that during production, a whole lot of chemical reactions go on and you get a whole lot of intermediaries and a whole lot of byproducts. And that's one of the reasons among others that we have, again, over 5,000 uh, of these compounds. So during production of intended products, there's lots of residuals and precursors and some of those are carried forward into final products. 
and some are not. Uh, some are discharged or, or go into a waste stream or what have you. Uh, many PFAS are used in making other PFAS products. Again, another reason that unknown, unplanned, unexpected chemical reactions and product reactions lead to there being more than 5,000 of these things. You know, a great many of those 5,000 weren't created by design. They just kind of happened. Um, so primary production facilities synthesize PFAS chemicals and then there's secondary production facilities that produce products using PFAS generally garnered from the primary facilities. So industry is changing its formulations, you know, in response to uh, public outcry, regulatory drivers, and the mounting evidence that these things are, are not good. Uh, but that process is slow, and we know very little about those chemicals. And in a lot of cases, they're not required to tell us everything about those chemicals. Some of the chemical and physical properties of PFAS, these guys are, it varies. Their, their range of their properties varies depending upon the carbon chain length. So whether they're short or long, uh, they may have four carbons and they may have eight. They, um, they generally occur as a mixture. So that's another challenge we have in understanding how these things really work and also finding them and measure, measuring for them in the environment. They provide a desirable performance in the industrial and commercial uses because they repel both oil and water. Now, a lot of chemicals do one or the other, but it's not often we have one that does both. The fluorinated carbon tail is the, the, the circle part, the part circled in red over to the right. It repels or is repelled by oil and water. And the functional group circled in blue is, can be a lot of different things. Uh, and that part is usually hydrophilic, which means it loves water. It's attracted to water. That functional group and the length of the carbons is usually how these guys are identified, how, how they're, there's other ways sometimes, but primarily through their, their length and whatever that functional group is is what gives the PFAS it, its name or its identity. So these guys are like, super surfactants, and those properties make them very good uh, surfactants, stain preventers, stain repellers, and uh, conditioners of all different sorts. The carbon fluorine bond is one of the shortest and one of the strongest in nature, so that's one of the reasons these things are so persistent, is because they're, that bond is really hard to break. And the, the microorganisms, the bugs and the bacteria and whatnot that you know, are usually out there breaking chemicals down, breaking things down, but it's just too much energy for them to bother with these uh, chlorine, floor, I mean, uh, carbon fluorine bonds. So they're unable to do it, or it takes them a, a really long time. And in some cases, they don't bother. They, they'll, uh, they'll find a, another source if, if possible. Plus, these guys are also really stable in acids, bases, oxidants, and exposure to heat. And it's, chemicals aren't usually stable in an acid and a base, uh, usually one or the other, but the, these guys are. So it further complicates or further uh, enhances their ability to stick around in the environment and make them such a challenge. So what are these things used in? Well, the list is way, way, way longer than what you're seeing on your screen here, but here are some common examples of where PFAS can be found. Uh, they're in food contact surfaces, uh, cookware, pizza boxes, fast food wrappers, popcorn bags, and fast food, the little cardboard boxes that you also may get fast food in has been shown to have uh, some PFASs in some case. Polishes, waxes, some paints, stain repellents for carpets, clothing, upholstery, uh, other fabrics of all kinds, you name it, it's there or has been used there. Lots of different kinds of cleaning products. Uh, a lot of personal care products, including shampoos, uh, denture cleanser, cleansers, dental floss in some case, and, and a lot of makeups. And their properties, the surfactants, you know, makes 
that desirable because it can get on you and do its thing, but it's it can also be easily or in some cases easily washed off, and in other cases not so easily washed off, depending upon uh, your 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 purpose. These guys have been used for dust suppression, for chrome plating, but also dust and foam suppression in other types of metal platings and metal etchings. Uh, they're used a lot or have been used a lot in the electronics manufacturing, oil and mining. They seem to enhance recovery in some cases. And they're also added to some performance chemicals such as hydraulic fluids and fuel additives. And of course, that we've already mentioned firefighting foams of various kinds. So where might these things be coming from in the environment other than the obvious, direct release from manufacturing or production facilities, which does happen sometimes. But other than that, landfills, they can leach uh, water from, from their area and, you know, air, just it's an unimaginable the number and types of products that have this stuff on it that we have thrown in the landfills and now it's all there potentially leaching out. Uh, the land where wastewater treatment plant biosolids have been applied uh, because this stuff since it's really difficult to get rid of it in the wastewater treatment process, it's going to end up in sometimes the effluent stream and also in the biosolids. However, you know, we believe that if, if you apply those things the, the way they're intended to, it is the level should be low enough that it, it would not be a problem. And then of course there's direct release, not just from the manufacturing facilities, but also in, in cases where they use firefighting foams. It's not just training uh, facilities, but it's also uh, small accidents or emergency responses or emergency actions that, that happen at facilities or airports and whatnot. And it's not on this slide because it's just now People are just now starting to look at it, but atmospheric deposition now also seems to be uh, one of the potential sources and release mechanisms of these things. Health effects. Well, again, this list is a drop in the bucket, <coughs> excuse me, of what actually has been studied or, or seen to happen, but one way to sum it up is to say, hmm, what can it not cause harm in or do? Because it seems like everywhere we look, we're finding things where it can be a problem, uh, toxicity and health-wise. But there, there's been studies on pregnancy-induced hypertension, uh, liver damage or hepatotoxicity, increases in total low-density cholesterol, which is not a good thing. That's related to your liver also. Uh, increased risk of thyroid disease, uh, decreased antibodies, so that's uh, immunotoxicity of various kinds, increased asthma diagnosis, increased risk, decreased, increased risk of decreased fertility, mostly in men, so lower sperm count. Uh, that's a reproductive effect. And small decreases in birth weight, which is a developmental effect. Uh, also, some many documented cases of neurotoxicity, kidney damage, uh, you, you, as I said, you, know, you name it. It seems that like these guys may play a role in, in causing harm. So what kind of regulations or not uh, do we have nowadays uh, or have had? Uh, not a whole lot. We are, we, we're, we're, we're considering a lot of things. Uh, EPA, but also states, of course, a lot of things are being considered, a lot of things are being proposed, uh, but there's not actually a lot in terms of past law or rule or regulation. But I, I think that's, it, it won't, it's not going to be long before that changes and there's going to be, uh, there's going to be more. But back in 2013, 2015, the Safe Drinking Water Act um, as part of the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule required six PFAS chemicals to be monitored. Uh, I mentioned before our Office of Drinking Water Health Advisories uh, uh, of 70 parts per trillion. Now, that is not a regulation. It is not enforceable. So the health advisories are there as a guide 
and sort of a recommendation, but they are not regulation or, or enforceable rules. Uh, recently, the National Defense Authorization Act, for the last couple of years, uh, PFAS wish list items have been attached to that. And some of them have made it through, and some of them have not. Uh, but for example, the, the Authorization Act in 2020 directed the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act to add 172 PFAS compounds to the Toxics Release Inventory, or the TRI. Now that's for, for reporting year 2021, which begins, I believe, this July. Uh, for reporting year 2022, I think they're gonna be required to add three or four more PFAS compounds to the toxic release, toxics release inventory. Also this year, the Safe Drinking Water Act, as part of the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule number five, includes 20, 29 PFAS to be monitored for drinking water facilities. So the UCMR3 said, gave six PFAS in the rule, and now, now we're gonna say it's 29. Safe Drinking Water Act this year also did the final regulatory determination to develop NCLs for PFO and PFOS, PFOS. That does not necessarily mean that MCLs are definitely going to be developed. That means that the EPA has been told basically to begin the process of developing MCLs. Uh, chances are it, it will, they will have MCLs for those things, but this, this process could take about six years, uh, but ho hopefully, hopefully they'll rush it. Uh, for Tosca, there's lots of little recommendations and actions that have taken place to reduce manufacturer use and to review uh, the development of new substitutes, uh, basically encouraging them to replace ones that they have, find substitutes. Uh, Tosca also, at the end of last year, uh, that has, has, a, has a significant new use role that certain imports cannot contain the longer chain PFAS unless EPA gets to investigate those things thoroughly and, and approve of them. So for the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, RICRA, it, PFAS are not regulated as a listed or a characteristic waste yet. That, that's one of those things that has been proposed. And for Superfund, it, PFAS are not listed as a hazardous substance. But also early this year, the EPA published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to seek public comment on this, on that notion of making PFAS or listing PFAS as a hazardous substance. So the advance notice of proposed rulemaking doesn't mean it's gonna happen, but it means that the EPA wants to hear from the general public what they think about that. And then they'll, then they'll go from there. They'll actually propose to do it, or not. So when we're looking for contam potentially contaminated sites, you know, there's, there's a general grouping of sites that we, we may focus on, like fire training, firefighting training areas, aircraft crash sites, airport hangars, uh, facilities that make and store firefighting foam, and of course facilities that make and, and produce the PFAS themselves. Uh, metal coating and plating facilities, which we, we have a lot of, wastewater treatment plants and their receiving water bodies if they discharge, and, and of course, landfills. So this loss list is not exhaustive, but if we didn't know any better, this is where we might would start. So as far as Superfund sites goes, if there's ever any reason to suspect PFAS may be there, we'll go look for it. So some of the current activities with the EPA's Office of Land and Emergency Management, uh, we are, and these numbers are probably a little dated. Uh, they are being updated or changed pretty regularly because we're always learning more and finding more. Uh, we're actively engaged in PFAS cleanup process at 32 federal facilities, national priorities list sites, so at least 32. Uh, it is anticipated that this number will grow because there are as many of, 
as 140 of these such sites. Uh, detections in groundwater have been as little as non-detect to slightly uh, higher than our health advisory of 70 parts per trillion and, and all the way up to 2 million parts per trillion. Uh, drinking water, as far as we know, has been, has been impacted at at least 17 of these federal facility NPL sites. So for non-federal facility NPL sites, we have 14 known at least 14 known, and a new one was proposed in 2017 or 2018 in New York. I'm not sure on the date there, but at least 14. Uh, but there are hundreds potential out there because we got, as I said, lots and lots and lots of old metal plating facilities and even more landfills for starters. Uh, EPA headquarters requires any regional investigation with a site that may have PFAS to consult with them. So we have a formal consultation process that we get other eyes and ears on what we're doing to, you know, more cooks in the kitchen and hopefully make the investigation stronger. Uh, cross agency within the agency and amongst EPA and a couple of other agencies where there's a very strong level of effort right now going on to learn more about the toxicity of these things. We know a whole lot about PFOA and PFOS and, and a few others, including PFNA and PFBS, uh, but we, we need to, we want to, and we need to know a lot more. And so we're starting with a list of about 30 that we're really going to try to tackle uh, the toxicity question and coming up with toxicity values like iris values or, or other sources, uh, other, again, other than PFOA and PFOS, because although we know the most about those two compounds, and so far evidence indicates they are the more toxic, those guys have been out of production for quite some time. So even though they're still out there, they may not be our biggest problem where PFAS is concerned. So we're, we're, we're still learning that. We're also constantly efforting to improve and develop new analytical methods because uh, chemical analyses of these things poses many challenges of its own. Okay, some things that are going on now or, or lately, we do have a work group that will effort towards developing NCLs. Again, that, that's no guarantee that it'll actually happen, but we have a group that's working that process. We have a group that is drafting a proposed rule to list PFAS as a hazardous substance. Uh, again, it doesn't mean it'll happen, but there is a group working on it. We have draft iris values and for Gen X, and Gen X is one of the first known and best known substitutes of the traditional PFAS chemicals. Uh, and a whole lot of research and efforts is, is going on in North Carolina for that chemical because that's where it, they're starting to find it out in the environment. Uh, we have a draft, uh, now we have a final updated version of the talks about of the iris values for PFBS. Uh, EPA released its draft guidelines for groundwater cleaned up. Uh, I think that was in 2019 maybe last year, but recently. Uh, the Air Force and EPA have a cooperative work group that's developing ecological screening values for PFAS. Uh, there are several publications out there that recommend values. A lot of the states may have some values for eco-screening, but there, there hasn't been a joint or a consensus-based set of numbers that can be used for ecological purposes and this document is almost done, almost ready for release by the Air Force. And hopefully that will uh, provide some consensus screening values for ecological. Um, so we have validated a method, a new method. Previously, we only could analyze for PFAS in water within only just a few years ago. So we have been working towards and now have a validated method that will allow us to measure for 24 PFAS compounds in soil, sediment, and, and tissue, so other matrices. 
Uh, that method has been out for public comment. I don't think it has reached the ultimate finalized finish line yet, but it shouldn't be too far away. Uh, and I also wanted to mention the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or ITRC, they recently put out their uh, long-awaited tech document, tech, technical support document, and have done one, maybe even two of their very well put together web-based trainings. Uh, so as to also go on with that, they have a set of fact sheets that they've had for several years. And last year they went through a set of updates. Uh, they have fact sheets on the introduction to PFAS, naming conventions, properties, regulations, guidance and advisories, the history, the use, the fake transport, site characterization, remediation technologies, and they have one specifically for AFFF. They are uh, very good fact sheets, very thorough, and ITRC, as with most everything they do, is a very valuable uh, resource for, for these things and, and lots of others as well. So that's it, thank you. Uh, if there's any uh, questions with whatever time we have, we can try to entertain those, uh, assuming my audio and everything else holds out. <laughs> thank you, Phil. I appreciate it. Sorry about the technical difficulties, and thank you for no being so patient with us. Um, I don't... Oh, I mean, I don't see any uh, questions in my chat box. Uh, you might check yours and see if we have any in yours. I'm looking and I'm, so far I, I don't see anything, but I'm not, I'm not sure if mine is trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if, if someone oh, did a question um, and we didn't catch it, um, please just email it to me and I will be glad to forward it on to Philip. And um, that, that and thank you, Philip, and thank you, everyone, for being on the line today. And um, we will go ahead and end this session. And the Brownfield session, I think we have just opened it up. So you guys jump off this one and jump on the next one. And we will see you guys shortly. Thank you again, Philip. I, I just wanted something did pop up in the chat box real quick, okay. but it was it was a uh, from Lakeisha. Hawkins, I, I don't know, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Really enjoyed your presentation, thank you very much. I'm currently working on testing PFAS and water treatment facilities. Would you mind sending me your slides? And the answer is yes, I can do that. So send me um, your email address and anyone else really. Uh, so my email is turner.philip at epa.gov and that's Philip with one L. My family can only afford one L when I was born. So any, anybody interested in these slides, yeah, just send me an email so I'll have yours and I, I will share those. I'll send those along. So thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Okay, yes, thank you everyone. We'll talk to everyone shortly. Thank you.